الحمد لله الحمد لله نستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن بك ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا رب العالمين Inshallah ta'ala, today we're going to be talking mainly about two things, which is A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem and Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. These two statements are used a lot when reciting Holy Qur'an. However, there is a lot of details behind the scene in terms of improving oneself, connecting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and understanding why these statements are there and how to apply these things in daily life. But before we do that, I would like to once again, for the increase of the Iman, would like to once again recite the Hadith, which has been recited last time as well, but I would like to recite it right from the text. And this was the Hadith about a person who is the companion and is reciting the Qur'an and his rooftop. عن أسيد بن حضير رضي الله تعالى عنه أنه كان يقرأه وهو على ظهر بيته وهو حسن الصوت. There's a companion of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم who is reciting the Holy Quran on the rooftop of his house and he had a beautiful voice. فجاء رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he came to Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فقال and said بين أقرأ إذا غشيني شيء كالسحاب when I'm reciting the Holy Quran something like a cloud surrounds me surrounds me and then what is my status والمرأة في البيت والفرس في الدار and I have a horse in my house and I have a wife in the house فتخوفت أن تسقط المرأة so I get worried about my wife that she may fall down out of fear. So and I'm also worried about my horse that it may run away. So I basically stop reciting. Prophet Muhammad said to him, You should continue reciting, you should not stop. This is an angel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which came down just to listen to your Qur'an. So this is basically the beauty of the Qur'an which basically we should try to get to. And this requires of course some hard work and inshallah we can get there. Now before we continue, <clears throat> there is another tafsir I ran into when I was going through different books in tafsir. Tafsir at Tustari. Has anyone of you heard of that? It was written probably, uh, the person was born around the time of Imam Bukhari. It's a very old tafsir, written around the time of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. And there is a very beautiful story about this individual. Because it's very important at a very young age, you should lay the foundation. So the name of this person was Sahal bin Abdullah. And he's from a place in Iran called Tustar. Later on, he moved to Iraq. He wrote his tafsir in Arabic. Not a very detailed tafsir. It is only around 200 pages. 
So one of the things that has been reported earlier in that, he said, I was a kid, and I used to wake up early in the morning, and I used to see my uncle, my maternal uncle, would be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> so when I grew up to a little age, I approached him, and he said, come on, sit with me. I'm going to give you three sentences, and you should recite those three times at night before you go to bed. That's it, three times. He said, no problem. He said, okay, give me them. He said, the first one is, Allahu ma'ya, Allah is with me. Second one, Allahu nawirun ilayya, Allah is watching over me. <coughs> Allahu shahidun alayya, Allah is my witness. That's it, three times. He said, okay. After a few days, he came back and said, I'm done. He said, okay, now increase it to five. Increase it to seven. Increase it to 11. He said, I practiced that for two years. And the change happened in the state of my heart. Just with those three statements, as a little kid. Why? Now, if you start looking at those words, I'm not going to share with you the advice that he received from his uncle. He said, when I get to a point of doing this as a habit, my uncle called me and said, Ya Sahal, O Sahal, Man kan Allahu ma'ahu, the person with whom Allah is present, wa huwa nadirun ilayhi, and he's watching over him, wa shahiduhu, and Allah witnesses. That's basically what his mental state, that Allah is with me, Allah is watching me, and Allah is witness. Ayu'asi, do you think that person will ever commit a sin? Iyaka wal ma'asiyah, I warn you, do not do that. Subhanallah, as a child that laid the foundation of him to feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his life. And then, in his tafsir, he writes a very basic rule on which he wrote his tafsir. He said, every ayah has four perspectives, four senses. Zahir, Batin, Had, and Matlaq. Zahir means whatever is outwards. And he said, outwards is the recitation of the Qur'an. Inward is the fahm al-Qur'an, the understanding of the Qur'an. Had, had means halal wal haram, what is lawful and what is unlawful. And the fourth one is matla, which allows you to establish your connection with your Lord, and you work on that connection to improve yourself. And this is basically the perspective of his writing the book on tafsir. So, a beautiful story that I wanted to share with you, because probably... We're going to be looking at some of his work. But anyway, as I said, we're going to be looking at today, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. We started to look at this briefly last time. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. I seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Now there are three important words in this one sentence. A'udhu, Shaitan, and Rajim. Allah, we were going to discuss that in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Ba will discuss probably in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as well. So I'm going to leave those two things out for now because those are very important things. We're going to leave it till Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We'll concentrate on A'udhu, Ash-Shaytan, and Ar-Rajim. Now, we talked a little bit about there's a difference of opinion between the ulama. Certain school of thought says, that A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim because they have their ayah in front of them from Surah Al-Nahl فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ Ar-Rajim Then there is another school of thought which says A'udhu Billahi Sami'i Al-Alimi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim because they have the ayah from Hamim Al-Sijda which says فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ Al-Alim so both are right in their perspective and both are totally fine to be said. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had in multiple places said in the Holy Quran that you have to seek refuge. You have to come in my protection from the shaitan al rajim And we also talked about a hadith where Allah's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, this is how you should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ash مِنْ هَمَدِهِ وَنَفَقِهِ وَنَفَثِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to come in your protection from the shaitan who is rebellious and who basically whispers in you, okay, do this, do this, who provokes you, who tempts you. Now, let's come to the very first word 
A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim the word A'udhu. Now, a lot of the time when people recite this, they are at the back of their head, they're thinking, okay, I am getting protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from shaitan rajim. But now there are other perspectives to this another statement. The statement. One is that you are requesting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I want to come in your protection. This is a request. So this basically humbles you. When you think like that, I'm requesting, this humbles you. And at the same time, there's another aspect to it which is called hope. That you have this hope that he will protect me. In both ideas, it humbles you down. So you're not making anything extra by saying, okay, today I recited one juz of Quran, mashaAllah. I need to be proud of. You have to humble yourself down because we were not able to do that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have willed so. So it, the attribute should go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim the core is request and hope. Now when we ask Imam Hafiz ibn Kathir, rahimahullahu alayhi, he says, ta'ala. This is a request to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He states that in his tafsir. Imam Raghib Asfahani, now who is Imam Raghib Asfahani? He was actually a person who lived seven, eight hundred years ago, and he wrote a book, the dictionary, Al Mufradat. And in that, he listed the Quranic terms and its explanations. In lots of the books of tafsir, you're going to find references to Imam Raghib Asfahani. His original name, his real name was Hussein bin Mufaddal, but he's called Raghib because Raghib basically means monk. And Asfahani because he's from a place called Asfahani in Iran. So that's why he got famous with the word Imam Raghib Asfahani. So he wrote the entire book and tafsir in Arabic language, and he also wrote this uh, Al Mufradat. So that's why he's mentioned a lot. He says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim The word A'udhu means Al iltija'u ila al-ghayr wa ta'alluq bih. This means that you're requesting somebody that I want to connect to you and leave all others. That basically is the connection. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paid so much emphasis on this that when you start to recite my book, leave the rest, connect with me. Okay, now the word isti'ada means two things. It means al-iltija, which is basically request, and what ta'alluq, which means connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next comes the second word, which is ash-shaytan. Now, when we talked about the tafsir in our earlier lectures, we talked about there's a special branch called al-ilm al the etymology. The etymology says, okay, let me pick a word and say which word it comes from. So according to the books, there are two words which are the root word of ash-shaytan. One is called shatan, and one is called shat. When we look at the word shatan, Imam Raghib Asfahani once again says, Ash-shaytan an noon fihi asliya wa huwa min shatan aytuba'id. That means this is the individual that has been sent away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one basis which is from the word shatan. If you look at the second meaning, shat, he himself explained, he says, man shata yashidu ahtariqu ghadaba. That means burning in anger. So if you look at it, shaitan has both of these capabilities. He has spiritual diseases like burning and anger and rage and animosity and envy. And at the same time, he's an individual that has been thrown far away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he falls in both categories. That's why they went to both root words and adopted both of those root words when they actually explained this. So what are some of the other spiritual diseases that you may see around us that probably may be a result of his influence on us? For example, you may notice that there are people who have these ill desires inside and then there are people who have ill thoughts. The people who have desired to do evil. Now, those are all different traits that spring from the same word, which is shat. That's the core of that word. The third word is basically ar-rajim. Ar-rajim has a core of rajm, which means basically, which is ar-rajam, which basically means a stone. And when somebody is stoned to death, we say ar-rami bar-rajam. And then the person who is stoned is called marjum. Now, why am you giving all these terminologies? 
Because the word rajim is based on marjum. Why? Because if you look at Surah An-Nas, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي وَسْوِسُ فِي صُدُورِ nas. He basically attacks your temptations. He attacks your nafs. So he is the attacker. As a result, you react. So that is why they have noticed that al-rajim has a core in one perspective, that it has... Imam uh, Ibn Kathir says, لَأَنَّهُ يَرْجُمُ النَّاسَ بِالْوَسْوَاسِ So he sits outside and he attacks. Now if you go back to the story of Adam and Eve, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the same thing, that he basically tempted them by showing them an illusion, a good picture, as a result they did what they did. Okay, now let's look at, generally speaking, when we say, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ At the back of our mind is, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me protection from Iblis. But that's not the only meaning of the word as shaytan rajim Yes, there is a meaning of shaytan rajim which means Iblis, the person, individual entity. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that in the Qur'an in several different places. For example, in one of the surahs, Surah Al-Hijr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا Get out from here. فَإِنَّكَ رَجِيمٌ وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكَ لَعْنَةَ إِلَى يَوْمِ الدِّينِ And the curse be upon you till the end of the times. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only threw him outside of the mercy, but also cursed him. Another ayah says, فَهْبِطْ مِنْهَا Get down from here. Okay? Get down from here. فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَن تَتَكَبَّرُ It is not your place to be arrogant and proud. تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا فَخْرُجْ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الصَّاغِرِينَ Who are you to belittle Adam? You yourself is belittled. Another trait Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al-A'raf. أُخْرُجْ مِنْهَا Get out of here. مَذْؤُومًا madhura. You are disgraced and expelled. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when talks about the Qur'an, and a lot of the people in the Makkah said to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, looks like a jinn comes to you and teaches you these things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Takweer, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ this is not the say of the shaitan ar rajim because he is the one who is expelled, thrown out of mercy. How could he be talking about a merciful message? So that's one aspect, that shaitan ar rajim What's the other aspect? Then there are people among us. There are probably jinn, there is another entity, and they also have good jinns and bad jinns, shaitan-like jinns or Muslim jinns, and people with faith jinns. So these are the people who have an evil mindset. And they influence us more than the Iblis himself. They're spread out. So that's another aspect of Shaitan al-Rajim, that the people who have the satanic traits, like envy and anger and desire to do evil, and they cause the fitna, the fasad, they're end-friendly, they whisper ill thoughts, they would be sitting in a gathering and all of a sudden they were going to say something and spread a rumor. They will sit with you and say, you know what, you know, frankly speaking, brother, I don't talk bad about anybody, but you know what, that guy, he does this. <laughs> okay? So these are some traits. These are some spiritual diseases. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ ذُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا And thus we have made for every prophet an enemy. Devils from mankind and jinn. So they're from both sides. Inspiring to one another in a speech which looks beautiful. But it is a false speech. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا When you say to these munafiqeen, these hypocrites, believe. They say, we believe. وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَىٰ شَيَاطِينِهِمْ But when they enter their satanic friends, the friends with the similar mindset, the similar spiritualities as they are, the problems that they contain, 
قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ We are with you. We are just lying to them. إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَهْزِئُونَ We're actually ridiculing them. We're making fun of them. We're trying to deceive them. So these are all traits that come from a satanic behavior. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-An'am says, وَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ لَيُوحُونَ إِلَىٰ أَوْلِيَائِهِمْ لِيُجَادِلُكُمْ the, the Satans whisper to their friends, do this, and that causes a disruption, that causes a fitna, that causes a fasad, and they argue with you for no reason. They will question you over and over again. doesn't matter how many times you try to convince them. They'll get back to you and say, you know what? This is, I don't understand this. And they don't mean to just understand it. They just mean, mean to make fun of you. So that, these are some of the traits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. And now let's look at the five different forms of this one point that I'm saying that these are satanic traits. Number one, whispering evil. And I already gave you one example. Now, each one of us know when we are in a situation, there is an inner voice that comes and says, do this. But then another inner voice comes and says, don't do this. I think it's not a good idea. And then you're fighting with yourself within. So there is a good source in us, and then there is a bad source in us. And you are making this battle within you. That is why... It was quite common among the earlier people that at night, before they would go to bed, they will make a list of the things that they did good today, the list of the things that they did bad today, and they will have a middle column that said, how many ill thoughts came in my mind and how did I react it? Did I act it upon or did I not act it upon? And how many of those thoughts were recurring? How can I fix that problem? Either they would fix themselves or they would go to somebody for help and say, okay, help me fix these problems. I've been getting these ill thoughts. Why? The idea was to fight this thing, which is whispering evil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf that starting from the times of Adam and Eve, فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ Shaytan whispered into them, do this. وَقَاسَمَهُمَا And he said, by God, if you eat from it, you'll stay here forever. This is how he convinces us. Don't worry, do this. Then you can repent later on. And we do it. And then what happens? Yes, we repent. But as soon as you commit that sin, the state of your heart hardens. If it is hardened, it hardens more. Then there comes a time we don't even realize that it's hardening. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that is why in Surah Al-Nas, min sharr al-waswas al-khannas, I want to come in protection from the evil whisperer who comes over and over again. Al-ladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur al-nas, and he whispers in the hearts of the men, min al-jinnati wa nas it could be from either of the two groups, from the jinn or from the insan, from the human beings. Another form, which is also practiced, unfortunately, in the Muslim world, which is called the magic. People try to win over certain things by using magic, where Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam clearly said, مَنْ أَتَى سَاحِرًا أَوْ عَرَافًا فَقَدْ كَفَرَ بِمَا أَنزَلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Whoever went to a palmist, whoever went to a magician, and want to know about the future or fix things himself by taking these routes, then that person should listen that he does not believe on what I was sent with me. Fortune tellers, right? This fortune tellers, the palmers, the tarot readers, you just name going on and on and on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Falaq says, وَمِن شَرٍ نَفَّاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ And seek refuge from those evil people who blow on the nuts. Third form, which is more common, is called the envy. Seeing somebody progress and not feeling happy about their progress. You may be smiling in your face, oh, congratulations, brother, but in your heart you're like, oh, man, I wish I had that. Why don't I have it? You know? Why do I have to drive 1989 Creator Corolla and he drives 2016? You know, you know that's... No envy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, I'm going to give you a form of protection. وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to come in your protection from the evil 
of an envious thing when the envy process starts. I want to kill it at the root. And here is a good, good fix that I learned from one of my teachers. He said, think about it like this. Anytime such a thought comes in you, think about it like this. Who gave you and who gave him? He said, Allah. He said, then are you questioning him? I said, yeah, wow, that's a good fix. I can't question. So at the moment, I said, okay, he knows who to give what. And a lot of people, they're poor. If they are given money, they will be the most corrupt people. Allah knows. That's why he doesn't give them money. So, any anyway, Allah knows the best. This is another form, which is, leads us into another thing, which is called an evil eye. Now, Surah Yusuf. Yaqub alayhi salam sends his 11 sons to enter into Egypt. وَقَالَ يَا بَنِيَّا لَا تَدْخُلُوا مِنْ بَابٍ وَاحِدٍ وَادْخُلُوا مِنْ أَبْوَابٍ مُتَفَرِّقَةٍ Oh my 11 sons, enter through different gates into the city. Do not enter through one gate. If somebody may see 11 sons, sons of Prophet, glowing, glamouring, I cast a bad eye. And this, remember one thing. This is something that I'm telling you from my wisdom. I cannot stop anything that will come down upon you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is just an, a measure that I'm taking. And Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, this is a hadith from Sahih Muslim, that means the evil eye is, is casted. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, under this ayah, when he describes this ayah in Tafsir ibn Kathir, he says, Al-Aynu Haqq Tastanzilu Al-Farisu Al Farsa. That evil eye is such a truth that it basically makes an expert horse rider fell off the horseback. And Imam Baghwi says, فَإِنَّ الْعَيْنَ حَقٌ وَجَاءَ فِي الْأَثَرِ That evil eye is true and it has something in it. إِنَّ الْعَيْنَ تَدْخُلُ الرَّجُلُ الْقَبْرُ And it is such a bad thing that can actually enter a person in the grave. So Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, whenever he would look at his grandsons, Hassan wa Hussein, he would say a dua. And he taught them the dua. وَعِيذُكَ مَا بِكَلِمَاتِ اللَّهِ التَّامَّةِ مِنْ كُلِّ عَيْنِ اللَّامَّةِ وَمِنْ كُلِّ شَيْطَانِ وَهَامَّةِ This is reported in Jami' al-Tirmizi in Kitab al-Tib in the Book of Medicine. In Ibn Majah in the Book of Medicine, similar dua comes with a little bit of different words. اللهم إني أعوذ بكلمات الله التامة من كل شيطان وهامة ومن كل عين اللامة Very similar words. The idea is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I want to come into your protection from anything bad that could happen unto me because of whatever you have given to me. Now the fourth thing is the influence of what we live in. We all have a company. We all have a lifestyle. We all have certain habits. They influence us. We don't know. Slowly and gradually that affects us. And when the outside influences find their way in you, they get into you. For example, if you're sitting with certain people, they talk about certain things that you don't like, but you don't say it out loud. They think, oh, he's on the accepting side. They keep doing it, doing it, doing it, pushing it, and then you are in. But if you oppose, they know exactly in front of him, we should do this. We're not going to pop like that. We're not going to approach that. And shaitan is the same way. If you stop him, he comes back harder on your nafs. And this is something that we all have experience in our lives. That you stop him, he waits. He goes back in his shell like a mouse. And then he waits. When you are in a state of cheese, he attacks harder. And then harder. Come on, you have been up till 2 in the morning. What if you skip Salat al-Fajr once? That's okay, you pray every day. That's okay. He loves you. You miss one day. The next day he makes you up another. What he does, he doesn't come back to you. Now he makes you late. Why don't you watch a movie? That's okay, it'll be done in two hours. Anyway, slept at 2 in the morning last night too. 
you watch a movie, he said, it's two again. Okay, miss it again. That's okay, you can pray qada. <laughs> then it becomes a habit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that yes, he affects. What is the other way he affects? When the likes of him affects a human being and afflict them and make them mad. Like you probably would have read so many stories. But the problem is, in these times, people have started making a business out of this. Oh, he's inflicted with jinn. Oh, bring him to me and we'll do stuff like that. He'll be hit like crazy. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't talk about that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the surah Al-Baqarah, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ riba, Those people who eat interest. لا يقومون, they will not going to stand up. إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطَهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسْ like a madman who has been touched by the evils. So yes, that state is there, but then there are certain people because of their things, they get affected by that. And a lot of the time, the ulama work on their spirituality. They ask them the first question, do you pray? Do you take shower? Do you live clean? What is, what kind of lifestyle do you have? What kind of people you sit with? Not these, don't start hitting these kind of people. So there's a way to approach individual. Everybody is different. Everybody has a different medicine. You can't give the same medicine to every individual. Now the fifth form is the false concepts. Now I've seen a lot of people, read about them, read their books, who are perfectly fine Muslims, but somehow their head flipped and they invented their own faith. Or they deviated. Or perfectly fine people said... I'm sick and tired of being good. And then they just go the other way. So these are the kind of things that happen and flip people around. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, they do affect you in these ways when you are weak. The Satan and his friends are watching you, the jinns. They can see you, you can see them. The people who don't believe, they're their friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, There are the people on the right path and there are the people on the wrong path. And why are they on the wrong path? We put them there because what did they do? They intentionally pick the shaitan as their friend over me. Okay. Go ahead. Go with your friends. This is the worst thing that could happen. You pick shaitan and you think you are righteous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, They have picked awliya min dunillah. They have picked shaitan as a friend. And they think that they are righteous. They are on the right path. And there are so many of them who claim that they're Muslims, but they're doing every law they can break, they're breaking. And then they are representing and they're doing things in the name of Islam, which basically hurts it more. Because that's basically what the message the other people receive who don't know much. Oh, this is how the Muslims are. But that's not how the Muslims are. So this is another form of shaitan attacking. So we have looked at two forms yet. The shaitan himself, and we looked at the satanic mindset. The third thing is, this is not an outside influence. This is your inside influence. When a person adapts the satanic behaviors, this is the third form which basically starts eating him from inside. Like a tree, when it's eaten inside, what happens? It's empty. It looks very strong from outside, but it's all empty inside. Why? What happens after that? The psychologists will tell you they started going into psychological problems. They start getting into depressions. They started taking meds to improve the state of their mind when the problem is in their heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, come to me and leave it all. Now comes another question. Okay, I have opened the book of Allah. I will going to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and start reciting his book. Why do I have to seek protection from shaitan? I'm doing something good. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When you start to recite my book, beware of the shaitan, go away from him and come to me. 
Now, one of the reasons the ulama has said, because you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you from him attacking you. Why? Because remember, when he was kicked out from the heavens, what were his statements? He was very disrespectful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي The way you misleaded me. He's telling to Allah that you misleaded me. بِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صُرَاتَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will going to do the same to this and bring them with me. This is his mindset. That tells you his mindset. He will do everything by hook or crook to take as many people as with him as possible and with time he also evolves. So he's not staying in 14th century. He's also coming up with new ideas. Okay, now the other thing he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا From this book, there are people who take guidance. But then there are people who read it and don't take guidance. And who don't take guidance? وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ Only the evildoers, those who are not pure in their intentions, they don't take guidance from this book. There are people who read this book and make fun of it. And that's what the kuffar of Makkah also did. Oh, what's the point of talking about bugs in the Qur'an? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a fly? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a bee? And why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a spider? But because they didn't know better. Today's science prove the scientific facts. Quran talks about the bee. Quran talks about the spider. Quran talks about the other beings. But they didn't know any better because they were not looking at it from the open mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadith I'm going to talk about before I go to the second reason. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said another form is that somebody will pick the book of Allah and just to fulfill their personal desire, they will change the meanings. They will keep the words, but will change the meanings to benefit. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ قَالَ فِي الْقُرْآنِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ فَلْيَتَبَوَّأَ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Anyone who speaks about this book without knowledge should know that he will going to find his place in hell. Because he changed the message. He talked something that was never talked about. Second reason of saying أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ that you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept you in his obedience. You are laying yourself down in his presence and saying, I am in you. Protect me. I don't exist. I humble myself down. I finish myself out. You, I am in your protection. You protect me. So ta'atillah. That's basically one of the reasons. Now, if we go back to Surah Ali Ibran, what was the main reason of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming? That was the dua of Ibrahim. What was the dua of Ibrahim? Oh Allah, grant him an individual. Yatlu alayhim ayati. Who are going to tell them your ayahs? Yatlu alayhim. Wa yuzakkihim. And will clean their souls from inside out. And then what will be the third step? الكتاب, then he will teach them your book and once they have gained the knowledge well hikmah then we're going to give them the wisdom and we talked about these steps the data the information the knowledge the wisdom that was the core so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says come to me I will guide you and the third reason is that you want to clean yourself inside what does that mean? When you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, you're saying, Oh Allah, I'm completely in your protection. I'm completely in your protection. It's pretty much like before you wear new clothes. What do you do most of the time? You wash yourself. You clean yourself. So before you wear the new clothes, this is a cleansing process. You are disconnecting yourself from the rest. To get connected with the Lord. So that is a very powerful word. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan al-rajim. So what you are doing is you're asking Allah, 
please take me in protection from the one you have discarded. Do not make me like him. I do not want to be thrown away from your mercy. Do not make me an individual that is away from the goodness. Make me an individual that is accepted by you. Make me an individual who is away from the ill feelings. Do not make me among like him. So all of these combinations are the thought process that runs through our mind when we say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem. When we say, Bismillahir Rahman Ar-Rahim, it means, in the name of Allah, the most generous, beneficent, and the most merciful. This is the core meaning. A lot of us understand it as how. But if you notice, this statement itself is against the rule of writing statements. And we're going to talk about that. Why is it against the basic principles of writing a sentence? And what is the reason behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically taking this perspective when saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Anybody who writes a sentence in English or Arabic or Urdu knows that there is a sentence structure and this statement doesn't follow that sentence structure. If you notice in the meaning, there is no mention of I or you. The only noun is Rahman, Rahim, Allah. Him is the only noun. There is no reference of Fa'il who is acting upon. And what is he acting upon? It is only Allah and Allah alone, which is against the principles of writing a statement. Imam Halabi in Umm Sir says that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a four-step process. In the old times, the Arabs used to write Bi ismika Allahumma. That's what this is how they used to write. And it was quite common. Everybody, every time they're going to write, Bi Allahumma. Then, Surah Hud, ayah number 41 was revealed. وَقَالَ رَكَبُوا فِيهَا بِسْمِ اللَّهِ مَجْرِهَا وَمُرَسَاهَا The Nuh alayhi salam said to his people, get on the ship, in the name of Allah, Bismillah. The word Bismillah was introduced. Second step, in Surah Al-Isra, ayah number 110. قُلِ دَعُوا اللَّهَ أَوِ دَعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ you may call him by the name of Allah or you may call him by the name of Rahman. Whichever name you call him by, those are his beautiful names. Third step, Surah An-Naml. When Sulaiman salam wrote the letter to Bilqis, he wrote, Innahu min Sulaiman. This letter is from Sulaiman. وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ And this is بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ In the name of Allah, I begin. Now, if you probably go back and run through your memory lane, you probably might have seen the seal of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he used to put on his letters. Does anybody remember the seal? How many lines does it have? Three, Three lines. What is the first word? Second word? Third word? How do you read it though? Muhammad Rasulullah. You don't read it Allah Rasul Muhammad. Muhammad Rasulullah. He did not like the fact that how can my name come in the first line and Allah's name come in the last line. This is the respect. This is basically Quran teaches us. Respect your Lord. And this statement, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, is a very respectful statement. That is why all others have been X'd out. It's only Allah. It's only Allah that has been mentioned in this statement. Now we'll talk about some juristic differences. Because there are different school of thoughts, they all believe that Surah Al-Fatiha has seven ayahs. There is no dispute in that. But is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim included or not in the surah is basically where the dispute is. For example, the group that says yes, it is included, to them the first ayah is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Second ayah is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Maliki yawm al-Din iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'een ihdina surat al-Mustaqeem surat al-Ladheena an'amta alayhim ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dalleen is the last ayah. Those who say that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not the part, 
To them, the first ayah is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Din, Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, Ihdina Surat Al-Mustaqeem. Now comes a real breakage. Surat Al-Ladhina An'amta Alayhim. This is the sixth ayah for them. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. This is the seventh ayah for them. So it's a seven consensus there. Now why is that difference there? It's between the school of thoughts. The Shawafi'a, in their books, there were, which I read, they consider it, the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, to be part of Surah Al-Fatiha. It is to them part of the Surah Al-Fatiha. And they have their reasons. There are three opinions. The second group of people in which Abdullah ibn Mubarak is included, and there's another call of Imam Shafi'i about this, and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. They said that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of every surah of the Qur'an, except for Surah Al-Baraq. It's part of every surah, not just Surah Al-Fatiha. So these are two opinions. The third opinion, which is adopted by Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, they said that we believe it on Abdullah ibn Abbas, who said, كان المسلمون لا يعلمون انقضاء كان حتى تنزل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم until unless بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم came, the Muslims did not know the difference where one surah ends and where one surah starts. So when بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم came, فإذا نزلت عرفوا أن سورة قد انقضت قد انقضت أن سورة قد ختمت واستقبلت أو ابدأت سورة أخرى. So it basically was a fossil. Basically, a, a wall between the surahs. That's basically their opinion that it's not part of any of these surahs. It's simply a way to distinguish between them. And this was the point of view of all the Qur'an and fuqaha of Medina, Basra, Sham. And based on that, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Sufyan al thawri Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Imam Awza'i, and a lot of those people actually take their reference from another hadith which I talked about last time. And that hadith was that when the hadith starts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I divided the fatiha between myself and my abd 50-50. And hadith starts with, when my abd says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The hadith doesn't start with when my abd says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So that was their consensus. Now, so we'll talk about both groups because they both have hadith. The second group says, uh, sorry, the first group says that the second evidence is, Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu reports that anna al-nabiyya wa Aba Bakr wa Umara kana kanu yaftatihuna salata bil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Abu Bakr and Umar would always start their salah out loud with alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen and the Shafi'i ulama's point of view is said yeah it's quite possible that you have only attended those salah where they did not recite it out loud because in the Makkan period, Muslims used to recite it out loud. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But then the people of Makkah used to call Musaylma ibn Kadhab ar-Rahman. So they used to make fun of the Muslims and say, Oh, so you're also associated with Musaylma ibn Kadhab. Then Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Okay, now recite it slowly. Recite slowly. Don't, don't do it loud. So Imam Suyuti brings that hadith in Dar al in, in, in al-Manthur and he said, فَأُمِرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِإِخْفَائِهَا فَمَا جَهْرَ بِهَا حَتَّى مَاتْ So until he died, we used to recite it slowly. So that's their perspective. Now, coming back to the Shafi'i ulama, they said, well, it's quite possible that these people would never have attended the salah where it was recited out loud. Second of all, they also bring in evidence from one of the hadith. And they said that Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu led a prayer in which he said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim out loud. And after he was done with the prayer, he said to the people present there, the tabi'een, that this is how I learned it. However, the other side says, well, the chain of narration with our chains are stronger than this chain of narration, so we'll take our narration. The school of thoughts have different opinions, but that's okay. We don't use these differences of opinions as a matter of dispute. <coughs> it's just a matter of understanding that, yes, both sides have hadith. 
So they both have ulama who have their understanding. So this is basically the differences between the school of thought come. When the ulama sit and they talk in, about these things, they basically have hadith on both sides because chain of narration is always a disputed matter between the ulama in some extent. For example, somebody will say, okay, I think this chain of narration is stronger than that chain of narration, so I'll take this hadith. The other will say, okay, I think this chain of narration is stronger than that one, I'll take this one. So it's, it's a matter, this is a special field in Islam, al-ilm al-asma' al-rijal. Al-ilm al-rijal, that means the, the ilm about the narrators, the chain of narrators. So it's quite possible that there is a difference of opinion. But since they are both practiced by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's the bottom line. So they're taking it from the sunnah. They're not taking it outside. It's not a made-up thing. It's just a difference of opinion. That's all it is. So we should keep it that way. So there are different difference of opinion. That's all. Okay, now let's look into one more thing. <coughs> According to Shawafi, now I've, I've noticed in this masjid I asked around, there are two different things that there are Shawafi, the Shafi'i people who recite Bismillah Rahman Rahim out loud in Salah. And then there are people that who don't. So it's quite possible that may be different opinions within the Shafi'i school of thought. Now, in Hanbali school of thought and Hanafi school of thought, Bismillah Rahman Rahim is recited, but not out loud. So they'll say, you probably may hear it in the mic, and then they will start reciting. Imam Malik is of a different view. Imam Malik says, since Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not part of the Surah Al-Fatiha, or is not part of the any of the Surah, it is only there as a division statement, so reciting it in prayers is makruh. He doesn't prefer it to be recited. Period. It is permissible, to do so, but it's not preferred to be done so. So that's the difference of opinion. So the people who include it as a part of the Quran, they will of course recite it out loud because it's just like Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And those who don't, they probably may either recite it out slow or will not recite it out, period. But anyway, let's quickly wrap it up over here and inshallah ta'ala next time we're going to look at the historical background of uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that from the Adam alayhi salam all the way to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi salam which other prophets used Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim or what was the beauty of this, this statement and inshallah ta'ala then we're going to look at the wisdom behind saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then inshallah we're going to explore the word Rahman and ar-Rahim and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to improve once again the status of our connection with him. Because both of these statements, which are at the beginning of any surah, what is the bottom line? Connect with me. Leave the rest. But how does that apply behind the scene is what we would like to look at. So before you actually go into Surah Al-Fatiha or you look into any of the surah, it is very important to establish a mindset. Very similar to when you come to the Salah, you notice there's a mindset process. What is the mindset process? The first thing is, oh God, I got to pray. Second thing, you get ready for praying. You make an effort to get to a point where you can pray and then you start praying. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to have a mindset. When you're standing in prayer, you remind yourself that I am standing in front of Allah. If I can't see Him, He can all definitely sees me. So I must now concentrate. Why? Because he is closer to me than my juggler Wayne. So he is closer to me than my juggler Wayne. He knows be that is sudur, what boils in my heart. He knows that. What comes in my head, he knows that. We're going to look at all those ayahs in the Quran, inshallah, next time. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about different mental states. So when we have this mindset, it is likely possible that we'll concentrate more in salah. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منه والأموات إنك تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا كريم يا غفار. اللهم صل على سيدنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم.